So, I mean, we've had a busy, busy week. And both I, on and off the both field. Both on and off the field. We had a GM in Washington get signed on long term. Happy that. I think I mentioned that in last week's podcast that Mike Rizzo it was sort of dangling there after they signed Davey Martinez. They made the deal with Mike Rizzo. Smart for the Nationals. Maybe the learners will decide to put some money in the team, but that we don't know yet. The Mets got their guy in signing David Stearns to be their president of baseball operations. I think Billy Epler's future is likely to remain no he's there he's, they, they, they've already decided they've that, they, that they want him there yeah and and i think it's, it's a good combination between the two of them um you know david stearns is going to suffer a little bit because i think there are some Mets fans like well they got david stearns they should make the playoffs next year and you know they're 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 going to maybe vie for a playoff spot at best the next but year i don't so. think they're evalu- they're going to be evaluating their progress as a franchise on whether or not they make the playoffs next, next year season. it is he is next there year, yeah. with the pitching lab that he set up in milwaukee and to make this organization the Mets organization, I should say, um, better from top to bottom along the lines, as they keep saying, of the Dodgers and, and the Braves, <laughs> quite frankly. So a guy that got dismissed this week, interestingly, was Heim Bloom up in Boston, was let go by the Red Sox. Yeah, he he. I don't think he ever recovered from the Mookie Betts trade. I think that was the fact that he didn't get Betts to re-sign, I think, ultimately doomed him. And then and then for to go ahead and what he did in, in return was bring in Trevor Story and paid Trevor Story not as much money as he would have had to pay Mookie Betts, but a but, ton of money, and that has not worked out. And some things have worked out. You know, the Red Sox have punched above their weight, I think people would say, the last couple seasons, that people were not expecting them to be good, and they've been plucky. I guess, but at the end of the day, they are still last now in the American League East. The Yankees have sort of risen up and overtaken them these last few weeks, but they've still been a team that's generally like, well, they're not as bad as we thought, but they're still not good. Well, they have some rookies that we talked about in the right. last podcast that are coming. So, and and I, I, I love their manager, like I mentioned. Um, I heard him talk about Alex Cora saying that maybe uh, general manager is something he'd think about down the road. And, and I think Haim Bloom, to that point, he was there to, you know, in a division where you've got the Orioles and the Rays doing more with less and the Red Sox spending money like the Yankees do and not doing quite as well. And something had to give. And it was high in bloom. Just stunning to me that he's gone before Cashman is. Yeah, well, I, I you know, I'm a Cashman fan, actually. So I, I will go right now and say I, I, I think that guy's done an amazing job over the years. And can a, can a guy kind of go south at, at, at later in his career, possibly, and, and lose his touch? I guess maybe that's true. I, I think the Yankees were, were poorly constructed. So you would lay that on the general manager this season. As much as the Mets were poorly constructed, you right. could lay that on Billy Epler the same way. I think, I think there would be a lot of fans in New York that would want both of those guys gone after this season so there's about so some teams uh have uh as we as we record this on sunday afternoon by the time the games end today i think the dodgers are going to have something like 11 games left um and other teams have as many as 14 games left there's only 13 uh, 14 baseball days left in the season uh, starting monday morning so some teams are going to be playing virtually every day some teams are going to have more off days kind of spread out in there but uh, you're really getting into the final stretch here And there's only a couple, there's really only one divisional, you know, two divisional races left in the American League East and the American League West. Yeah. The, 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 the NL Central is close, but the Brewers kind it's of not solidified close, really. their whole I think they have at it. least a five or six right. game lead they on the Cubs. opened it up this week. Um, but the the AL West is still a dogfight because the Rangers, the Astros, and the Mariners the virtual are Virtual tie. Yeah, virtual well, the, the Rangers and the Astros and the Mariners are, are just slipped a little behind. Like a half game back. And then in the AL, like we were saying, you know, the Orioles, you know, had opened up such a big lead. But the Rays, you know, after scuffling a little bit about the around the All-Star break, have really kind of come on strong and played good down the stretch here. Do you remember how far... The Rays were ahead at the beginning, and we were talking about that team being like one of the great teams of all time because they well, started out ridiculous. We should have learned our lesson from the Yankees last year, right? Right, and 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 you knew they'd come back, but I don't think we would have thought that the Orioles would have been the team to run them down, right? And and be able to stay in there. And John, my, one of my favorite Oriole pitchers had a, had a good game in his first game back. John Means and how he pitches in the playoffs, or if he pitches in the playoffs, because you wonder if the guy can pitch much more than five innings. He hasn't. Pitched I, I just worry that that John. young Orioles team, who who a lot of the advanced stats don't favor them that much runs into a brick wall in the playoffs and bounces out almost a little unceremoniously. I I, I don't think that'll happen because I think they're too good a team, 
but I worry that it could. I, I like the versatility of the team, particularly on offense and, and their bullpen with Batista, Felix Batista being, you know, at the front end of it or, or the back end, I guess. I don't, I don't know how you'd say it. Um, he, he of the... Gives them a different dimension. But he of the UCL problem, right? So he's going to pitch through the UCL. And that's really interesting to me, right? Because... Shohei has a UCL. He's done pitching, and he's not going to pitch again as he packed his bags and went back to Japan, obviously. Um, but they're going to still try to have this guy pitch through it possibly instead of having surgery because they have a chance. That's wild to me. That is why. But granted, he's only throwing one inning as opposed to Shohei being a starter. And so it'll take longer for his arm to fall off? Is that what you're so saying? They're going to try and see if they can get through it. But we don't know that they're actually going to get so far as to using him in a game. They're just trying to see if it's possible right now. Yeah, I, I just, you know, and, and it's so critical for, for all the teams. Um, and, and I saw uh, Kelly Troop put out this week the fact uh, her, her three-inning minute on, you know, hey, it's a crapshoot as you get into the into the tournament, right? There's 12 teams out of 30. She mentions almost 50% of the teams make the playoffs. And, yeah, we, we all know that. Um, but... The, the idea that your bullpen is, is such a more important part now at this point. The Phillies made it to the World Series last year, we think, in part because their bullpen went off the charts and pitched way above their, you know, their abilities, and that's how they were able to get all the way to the World Series. The mm-hmm. other teams that are the, the, the big contenders all have really good bullpens, and that's what I think this, this playoff format now really requires a team to go all the way. You can get in. Right, but if you don't have that there, you're not going to necessarily make it all the way, or even that far at all. You know, possibly. Right, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. The teams that have elite bullpens are, but those are the teams that have the elite bullpens are the teams that are also leading the divisions. It's kind of go hand in hand. So, so it makes me think why the Padres, who aren't in it, decided they might have a chance. They've got Hader, they've got a, Martinez, they got a bunch of guys in the bullpen that are really good that pitched well last year. Whereas the Mets looked at their bullpen once they didn't have Edwin Diaz. They're like, well, there's no way. Even if they had Edwin Diaz. I don't know if that bullpen was enough yeah, to, com- to compete. It would have been hard for them to win a World Series without the starting pitching being overwhelmingly good. And the Yankees kind of had the opposite, right, this year. Is they just didn't get, besides Garrett Cole, they got nothing consistent from their starters. They couldn't get to their bullpen, which right. was a pretty good bullpen. So I, I think in the playoffs, you're going to see, you know, these teams that are kind of hanging on. They have the Angels. They didn't have a bullpen that was going to get anywhere, so they didn't even bother competing at the, at the trade deadline. Mm-hmm. The Rangers, they've got a nice bullpen, but... I don't know if they make it in the Mariners. That's a good bullpen. Yeah, and and so I, I think I think these teams are gonna you know kind of make it through, and that that the wild cards are, you know are going to you know make some noise, but it's going to be dependent on 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 you know their relievers uh, to to help them get into the World Series if they can. Yeah, I, I, I tend to think that you're generally going to see. That's why the Astros and the Dodgers is because they seem to find a guy every year in that bullpen that's unbelievably good and having a season. The Rays have kind of shown that, and you know with Definitely. a team like the Orioles, if they can't get yep. an effective Batista back, I don't think they have that nearly to the same degree. And you you, you brought up, you, you stole my thunder because you talked about the um, the Astros and, and the Dodgers. Both of those teams, like there's weird things that went on with their starting pitchers. You think about all the guys that went on. Same thing in Tampa, by the way. McCannahan, yeah. Rasmussen, uh, Springer, all gone for the year. The Dodgers, like everybody. I mean, I think Kershaw is like the only guy that was there, and he's not necessarily a six-inning pitcher. Um, so, I and, and the same thing with the Astros. You know, they're down to where, you know, some of their guys aren't pitching anymore, and then Framber Valdez is sort of shaky. Yeah, you know, a whole bunch of guys have been shaky. So, J.P. France might get a start in the playoffs. Yeah. And I don't think you would have thought that before the season. So, you know, the bullpens will help them, but in the playoffs, you know, the, the, the starters don't necessarily go six, seven innings anyway. Um, and one starter who isn't doing that is is, um, and I, I think I put out this week, and, and of course, Jason Stark had already written an article about it before I put it out. Zach Greinke mm-hmm. is 1-15 in 15, uh, this season, and he that is one of the worst, might be the worst season for a starting pitcher who's going to be a Hall of Fame player in the history of Major League well, Baseball. Well, worst final season, I'm going to guess. Well, I'd say worst season. I mean, I'm um, just on record. And we went and, okay. and we over we over evaluate one 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 in fifteen is pretty right. Pretty but brutal. he's playing for a crappy team. Right, right. You know, as an, and he's gotten like no run support. No, he's he's he hasn't pitched as bad. You know, and I didn't realize that. I guess in his first season he went something like one in eleven. Zach Greinke. So he's just so bookending he's had, his career. Yeah, isn't that wild? So and we're assuming he's not going to pitch anymore after this season. Um, I think he said he's done. Yeah, and so and and, and we think he's going to be a Hall of Famer. But I was surprised at some of the comments that came back. This week and how 
not everybody agrees with me and us, I think. No, I mean, we, ha- we heard a lot of really good things, and we always love hearing things from people, you know, from the fans and from people talking about us. Because I do remember one of the Royals fans saying, like, if you adjusted Granky, even if he was receiving, like, league average run support, he would not be nearly as bad. Like, he's gotten, like, I think he's gotten, like, under two runs a game or something wild in terms of run support. So that can definitely lead to a guy having, like, a one-off bad season. But I think that... that he was 5-17 and 17 in his rookie year. That's my mistake. Right, but I think that he's still a Hall of Famer, and I know some people out there that we saw on Twitter and stuff were saying, uh, is he a Hall of Famer? But I'm like, if Zach Greinke isn't a Hall of Famer, are you really telling me there's only three Hall of Fame pitchers from this era? I agree. That's a great point. I, I just don't see it that way. And he's 34 strikeouts shy of 3,000. And I almost could go out and say, if you strike out 3,000 hitters, now you have to do things that say you're not a Hall of Fame right. pitcher. It's kind of hard. You don't strike out 3,000 guys by accident. Right, right. And it's not like Greinke's striking out guys. Like He's probably not going to get the 3,000 strikeouts this year. He's not going to necessarily No, he's not going to throw out 34 so, guys so in the final. That's, that's, it would kill you to finish with 2,991. But, but I don't think he's going <laughs> to come back to strike out nine guys next season and then retire. This is Zach Greinke you're talking about. He might. Yeah, but, that, that is a very Zach Greinke thing yeah. to do, by the way. Actually. Come back enough to get the number and then just be done with it. <laughs> I, I think just walks off, He gets a 3,000 strikeout. The inning's not even over. just walks off the field. I want I want to go back to the Angels for a moment because uh, obviously, you know, the, the news came out this that Shohei was spotted in an airport in Japan. Yeah. Uh, so, and then all of a sudden, the next day, it came out that he was out for the season with an oblique injury, and that's why he wasn't going to play anymore. So he's he's injured, obviously. Um, and you know whether or not. Uh, and then the strange thing with Rendon, with his his. Uh, my, oh yeah, my uh, legs actually my, been broken. My legs been this. broken for a while. They just didn't say it. Okay, uh, and and th- that signing for their Angels has got to be one of the all time. So and and Trout saying that obviously I want to. Maybe be traded. If you want to trade me, I'll listen to being traded. So Joe Posnanski put out this this week, and this is pretty amazing. Um, over the past eight seasons, you could argue that the Angels have had the best player in Major League Baseball every season, that being either Trout or, or Otani. Yeah. And yes, Aaron Judge won the MVP, but, but yeah, let's yeah, say yeah, that yeah. that year, Otani, because he pitched and all that stuff, was was, was most valuable in that, in that respect. Um, anyway, um, in all eight of those seasons, the Angels had a losing record. How? Can you have the best player in baseball on your team? What's a team and have sport? A losing record every season. I can can I don't even know if that's possibly ever happened. You know, in, in baseball before. Well, generally no, because it, 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 the best players are usually on the best teams. It's unusual for really good players to be on a crappy team. But the Angels have basically not run that. They've they've tied up their money in. The other guys and none of the other guys they've brought in at any point, whether it's to bat around Otani and Trout or to pitch around Otani and Trout, have given them anything. And I think you mentioned the pitching, right? So besides Otani as a pitcher, okay, can you name one Angels pitcher over the past eight years and say, well, yeah, that guy was a really good pitcher. I think it's, and you can't say Jared Weaver because that was before that. Right. No, no, there's no guy that you could, there's probably a guy that has had a good season for them would be the kind of thing where you don't remember that and you didn't really know about it. And so I think that just not having any kind of consistent pitching either in the rotation or the bullpen and then you, you top that off with guys getting hurt all the time, having virtually no lineup protection. That Yeah, sure, both of those guys are remarkable, but the, you can't carry a team to wins by yourself, even as good as they are. Clearly, it's not the case. And, and it tells me that because I have trouble naming angel pitchers, mm-hmm. that, that maybe pitching was part of the problem. You know, they tried to bring in Syndergaard, mm-hmm. and he was already kind of toast when he got there. So that, that wasn't like bringing in a big-name pitcher. Where, where have they gone and brought somebody in saying, oh, these guys are serious. They're bringing in a pitch right now. They just are not doing it. So um, I, I just hope for angel fans' sake that Artie Moreno, that they, if they're going to tear it down now, if they let those guys go. Well, it's not an if. Otani is gone. That much is obvious at this point. Right. I, I, I'd say that you know, the chances of Otani being an angel next, next year are less than 5%. I, it's not going to happen. He, there's no way he's going to be an angel. You're saying 0%. 0% chance. Wow. Um, and Trout, uh, I don't know. I mean, does he want to be part of a rebuild? And But who's going to trade for him? So Somebody will trade for Trout. Yeah. yeah. He's too good a player not to. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, Cole Reagans. Did you did you see the video this week? And I, no, we should put this up. So Cole Reagans, um, pitcher, um, was uh, pitching against uh, for Kansas City. Came over in the Chapman deal, and he's he's pitching, yeah. pitching against the Blue Jays, and he catches his spike in the first one on the mound and he falls down. 
And the ball, oh, goes, the ball goes threw, flying to the backstop. Right. He, Ricky and killed it like two pitches in a row. Three in a row. Then the next pitch, he, he, he loses the ball and it goes flying out. And, and so they scored the, the tying and the winning run. And then the next pitch, he gets his spike caught again on the third time. And it goes wild and they lose the game. And, and I think they think the, the go-ahead one it wasn't uh, over in that. It wasn't a walk-off situation. Mm-hmm. But that was the strangest three-batter sequence that the I three can pitch remember. three-pitch sequence. Uh, yeah, three-pitch sequence. You're right. Uh, three-pitch sequence that I have ever seen. So, yeah, go back if you can and, and check out Cole Reagan's and see what it did. And I, I think I posted on the going, what? Is somebody kidding me here? Did this this didn't really happen, did it? Well, it obviously did. So uh yeah that, that was and a- then yeah and then we had uh Matt Waldrone get the first knuckleball win since 2018 with Boston Stephen Wright. Nice to have a knuckleballer in the league again. It's always fun when there's at least one of them floating around, you know, literally. Yeah, I think Mickey Janis was the for the Orioles was in the league like three or four years ago was the last knuckleballer. So this would be but he wasn't getting any wins. That would that would this would make the thirty third knuckleballer in the major leagues in the history of major league. Baseball. Very exclusive club, right? We did an episode uh, on knuckleballers, and I was stunned at the time that we were only thirty two, and now there are thirty three. How about um, the players who had really good weeks this week? Um, you know, uh, I think the most interesting thing is that you know you have some guys on bad teams that had great weeks bobby witt jr is still kind of showing that he is going to be a superstar level player for kansas city going forward you just have to hope that he's not in a mike trout shohei otani situation where the royals are unable to kind of feel the team around him to take advantage of how good he is and Luis Arias had another good week. That's not a bad team per se. Ah, they're they're hanging around. They're seventy seven and seventy two. They're in that third wild card spot. I think they're they're certainly the type of team that 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 has a shot going down. And I think both them and the Twins would say that was a good trade for them. I was going to ask you that. So Pablo Lopez also on the list for having a terrific week. Uh, and and so who won that trade? And you're saying it's a uh, both teams won. It's a it's a win win for a change. It's a win win for a change. The they, Marlins got a guy that's you know a integral part of their lineup, and the Twins got a really good pitcher. And I think for both teams it made sense because. Arias is the type of guy that, you know, you need a team that's kind of having a special season in some respects, like the Marlins, to really take advantage of. And having another big, strong pitcher in there for Minnesota is kind of why they've been able to just sort of yeah. stay afloat in that central. Where Despite every- the lousy season that Correa's had. Exactly. Right? If he would have had a, you know, a season that they expected, I think they would have been way ahead and put that division away two weeks ago. And then you have you know, a guy like Trey Turner who just turned it on after he got that standing ovation it was like a light clicked on for him and he suddenly remembered how to play baseball yeah his b war for the season is up now to 3.7 so he'll maybe he'll end around four which will be a down year for trey turner it'll just when you look at his year and i think this is something to look at because we were looking at you know how did kyle lewis win the rookie of the year in 2020 that's like well it was a 60 game sample and so if you look at Trey Turner and you isolate the beginning of his year, oh, my God, he was just god awful. He was terrible. But then when you you add in the full context of his season, it's just a slight downturn. But all of our perceptions of Trey Turner is this year as if he's been truly horrid. And I think that can happen with teams sometimes, too. You had a team like the Rays come roaring out to this unbelievable start. Best record of all time. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but then they, they have a little bit of a struggle. But because they started off that way, you very much get to the mindset that that's what they are for yeah. that season. Yeah, yeah. And another guy who I, I think, you know, as Met fans, we're big Lindor fans, and we think he's underrated, which is hard for a guy getting paid as much as he does to be underrated. But, um, you know, really good defensive player, having a great defensive season, really good hitter. Um, this guy is having one of the all-time great seasons at shortstop, and it's going under the radar is Corey Seager. Right, Corey Seager's been unbelievable this I mean, year. I mean, the numbers that this guy is putting up in the season he's having is not to be believed, and he's done it. I, I, he got hurt for a little bit of time, which hurts his sort of MVP you know, standing a little well, bit, you know. Not, I guess Shohei's going to win it anyway. But Shohei was always going to win this year's MVP. Right, right. But Seager, you know, that when they gave him all that money to come from the Dodgers over there. He's showing that he was clearly worth that. I mean, and, and that team is hanging around in large part because he is, you know, a guy you can't get out when you need to. Um uh, Royce Lewis is having with, with the three grand slams four. in four yeah. grand slams in nine games. Or he had another games. one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's 
un- hasn't happened in uh, ever. I don't even I mean, know. The guy had an unbelievable streak of grand slams, but grand slams are as much a thing of circumstance as anything else. It's really hard to be a guy that's good at hitting them because you have to get up with the bases loaded and you have no control over that. But it helped, it helped the twins certainly, you know, maintain their lead and sort of have them sort of comfortably, you know, win well, their they're division. already comfortably winning. Yeah, well, division. because the Guardians are Every, so I mean, inept. Anemic on offense. So inept. I, I don't understand how that team went into the season thinking, yeah, we couldn't hit last year. We won't change anything, and maybe we'll just hit more. Oh yeah, well, we'll clearly get the same year out of Andres Jimenez again. Well, yeah, right. That hurt them, and and then they traded one of their better hitters for Noah Syndergaard, and then they cut Syndergaard. That's a bizarre they, trade, right? I, I mean, they must have really not liked Ahmed Rosario to do that to the guy. I mean, well, I don't know what he did. Playing great for the Dodgers. So, uh, and Matt Olson, I guess we've got to give a shout out to well, the I mean, Brave. Set the Brave single season record for home runs, right? When breaking Andrew Jones, and I don't think I really would have thought that Andrew Jones had the all time record. I would have thought somebody like Eddie Matthews. Uh, have. I would have. Hank I Aaron knew Jones never hit, hit fifty. I knew Jones hit fifty one. Right. And it, Hank Aaron never did. Right. So that's kind of how I knew he had to be up there. Right, right. So, uh, you know, Matt Olson, I guess making Braves fans forget about Freddie Freeman? I don't know. Freddie Freeman's having a ridiculous Freddie Freeman like season. Happy, though. If you're a Brave fan, yeah, Freddie is great, but you have Matt Olson, so you don't care. And so you can really tell yourself you're a Brave fan going, well, and we didn't spend as much on Matt Olson as we would have spent on Freddie Freeman, so we were able to sign Michael Harris and, and, a, and potential Cy Young winner and Spencer Strasburg. Ozzie Albee. I, I don't Nakuna. think Strasburg gets the Cy Young this year. Yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, you were pretty clear on that when I asked you, and I, when I told you that he's got 200 and more than 250 strikeouts in like 180 odd innings. That's pretty ridiculous right, but, for a starting but pitcher. But he's also got like a four, almost a four something ERA. Yeah, and it's just it's hard for me to have a guy like I, it's not the, it's not the pitcher that strikes out the most guys that wins the Cy Young. No, it, it, it doesn't uh, because Dwight Gooden would have won more than the one that he did. Exactly. If that's the case. And so I think there are other guys in the NL that have had better seasons that will get it, whether that's Justin Steele. I think Zach Gallen hurt his chances by having a stinker against the Mets the other night. I think Kodai Senga will not win the Cy Young, but he'll finish in the voting for both Rookie of the Year and Cy Young. What about Blake Snell? I think Blake Snell could win the side. I, I think he's probably the guy who's going to get it. And, and you know, every, the Cub fans love this Justin unless Steele. Unless Justin Steele has an unbelievable, like, final two starts to the season and, like, really powers the Cubs into getting a wild card spot or the division somehow. Right, right, right. Then I think it's either, I think it's Blake Snell. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, you know, you can do that these days, right? You didn't used to be able to win a Cy Young for a team that actually isn't in the playoff race. Well, I, I think because Felix Hernandez sort of got his career Cy Young that one year where they were like, okay, he kind of has to get one at some point because he deserves it. So he just they just gave it to him in one season where, like, he didn't have that. He had, like, 12 or 14 wins that year. It was, like, the lowest number of wins ever right. by a Cy 14 Young 14 wins, winner, yeah, right, right, you're right. And, uh... I think ever since then, they're a lot more okay with giving it to a guy that's on a not good DeGrom team. DeGrom would be a guy who, the same thing, it wasn't about wins and losses, and, and I think we know that. Um, let's let's wrap it up now and talk a little bit about the year that baseball has had, just because the stats came out. We, you know, we'll, we'll summarize the season, but from a standpoint of people going out to the ballpark to watch games. Our TV is up, attendance is up. It's a great thing. It's it's really impressive that the the average uh, MLB attendance, by the way, in, in early August was 38,000 fans a game. I didn't realize the average. Obviously, there are teams with more than that and teams with less, and you got the got to carry the A's and all that. Uh, to, um, so all 15 games that day on Saturday, August 5th, drew 30,000 people or more. So you hear people say, oh, baseball is you know, going down the tubes. And well, I think that, that, was the, that was the narrative up until this year, but I think the pace of play changes have really helped bring people back to the game <sighs> boy that seems to me to be I, I just can't believe it would happen that quickly that everybody hey marge you know uh the games are a lot faster now let's go to the game let's get in the car and we can be back in two and a half hours i don't see that but happening I think, I think what it is is people are more engaged again more people are watching more games on television so there are more fans and more people are following than they have in previous seasons and that's going to get people out to the games more 
People are going to the ballpark, though, in numbers, and we know how expensive it is to go to a major league game. Um, and, and I don't know if it's an ec- economic harbinger or anything like that, but to think that, you know, when people are saying the game has lost something, that people are willing to pony up and go and, I mean, you drop go to a major league game. You drop a lot of money. That's a lot, not just on the tickets, by but, the way. But now I think the fact that it's not something that is, in, that it is a laborious affair, which it could be. I remember going to games, and you would just get into those late innings where you start getting all the pitching changes. Right. And the game just drags out and becomes unfun at a certain point i think it isn't as much that way and so it, it just feels like a more enjoyable experience for your dollar and the pitch clock i think we might have mentioned it or not will be in effect for the entire playoffs. we talked about this, okay yeah. so i think that you know that's basically nodding to the fact that this is working and for the point you make out maybe it's keeping people more engaged they don't want people to turn off in the playoff game because they want don't want to watch you know the pitcher stand out there and you know mm-hmm. you know look like they don't know what's going on oh yeah exactly so um so we got you know uh, two division winners uh sort of set aside we've the next we'll have seven more games we're going to be down to the last seven games do you think we'll have any more clinching between now and when we record next Sunday? Oh, for sure. You think one of the other, so you think that, who do you think is going to be? Twins will clinch. You think the Twins will clinch? The Twins will clinch their division. I think the Brewers could end up clinching their division. Okay. And then you'll only have the AL East and West remaining going in and then the wild card races. And then the last week of the season, it'll be all those playoff teams slotting their pitchers to, yeah. to line them up to and pitch in the playoffs. in the NL with that final wild card spot, it's going to be a dogfight to the end. No doubt.